Josh Dax, later with the camera and explicitly video with this is Alexa Hamilton and we're good to go. This is Alex Kuma. Uh, so we are theater planning and design consultants, uh, which means that we work with uh, both people that want to own and operate performing arts buildings, uh, dance companies, uh, uh, symphonies, that kind of thing to plan buildings, and also we collaborate with architects to design buildings for the performing arts, opera houses, concert halls, all sorts of things. Um, uh, next. <laughs> okay. So we work on a really wide range of projects. You're probably familiar with some of them. This is uh, the ICA up in Boston. We did with Joe Scafidio. Um, this is the new Mariinsky Opera House in St. Petersburg. Uh, which is a very different kind of problem. The, the ICA is just a simple bank of seats, very, you know, straight rows, very straightforward thing. This is a very complicated animal. This is a nearly 2,000 seat opera house with a tight horseshoe footprint that um, has some really difficult sightline conditions to, to deal with in order to put this portion form on a very tightly constrained site. The ability of you to see from some of those top corners over the curving railing down to the stage is a very complex three-dimensional problem. Um, we work on uh, too many scales. This is a really bad photograph of something called Philharmonic 360, which was an event we designed at the Armory, which is another one of our projects, um, adapting that amazing building to accommodate uh, uh, contemporary performance in a lot of different ways, and also designing a lot of the performances that are in the archive. Um, we do a lot of spaces for media. Um, this is a project called Impact up in Troy, New York, that we did in the Grimshaw's office. This little 400 seat theater is heavily equipped with computerized rigging technology, lighting technology, and all sorts of projection. Um, uh, and as I said, we do a lot of concert halls. Next. Uh, we're working on the Culture Shed right now. Uh, down, again, the DSR. Next. Um, and in all of these problems, one of the fundamental requirements uh, for performance spaces is that people be able to see what's going on, right? And that, that stands the reason. Which means thinking carefully about it in plan. Um, Coming up with schemes that have staggered rows to simplify the, uh, your ability to see overheads, um, and thinking carefully about what the topography of the section is. So, so one of our fundamental tasks is to play with this geometry next. Um, and you know, there can be a lot of different relationships between performers and seating. So, you know, sometimes the performer and the audience are in the same elevation. Sometimes. The performer is actually lower than the audience. Sometimes the performer, most typically, is raised above the audience. And all of those things contribute to a different um, set of geometrical requirements and maybe different steepnesses of, of uh, auditorium. Um, so, you know, we're concerned about our ability to see downward and see, you know, the toes of a dancer standing at the edge of the stage. But we're also concerned about upward sight lines. So sometimes balcony overhangs get in the way and block things like speed clusters or super title screens above the stage. So we're not only concerned about whether you can see down far enough, but we're also concerned about whether you can see up far enough. Um, and uh, you know, there are different ways that you can do this. If you just uh, set a constant rise, if you say we're going to rise six inches per row infinitely, the sight lines are parallel lines. And the more rows you have, the worse you see. So if you're at the back of that, you're going to see worse than the person in front of that because it's all the parallel lines. But if, if you use a technique where you set a single point that everybody has to see, um, and then you just sort of go through the motion of, of drawing line from an eye over a head to that point, you end up with actually a parabolic slope. Um, and uh, it, it contributes to a, a, a sort of steeper section, uh, but better viewing. Uh, so all of this interrelated geometry, how high is the stage, what's the target you're trying to see, what's the back-to-back -back dimension of the seating, um, where is the balcony, uh, what's the elevation of the first row relative to the stage, all of these things um, start to drive some complicated numerical relationships. 
Um, and I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago, I started writing uh, an Excel spreadsheet that has sort of grown out of all proportion. That you could enter all of the code, uh, all the code information, uh, how many you know, how many rows are on on uh, on work, you know, how many rows are on the balconies, all of these parameters, the numerical parameters that shape the section of an auditorium. Um, uh, all of the code parameters, all of the acoustical parameters, like uh, apertures between balconies. Whoops, forgot to turn that off. Um, apertures between balconies that begin to set the heights of the balconies. So we could go from this straight into AutoCAD, basically. So uh, you enter your parameters, and boom, it draws it uh, <coughs> in 2D. Uh, which means that you can sit in a meeting with an acoustical consultant and start talking about what would happen if we moved the balcony back a row. And you go tap, 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 and then you see it on the screen. So in the course of a meeting, you can crank through a lot of different uh, scenarios really, really quickly. This is an example of a study for, I forget what, um, with many versions overlaid. Uh, but it's also an incredibly three-dimensional problem because you can't just think about it on the center line, particularly in things like that horseshoe-shaped opera house that I showed you where everything is curving. Um, and the condition on the center line is very different from the conditions at the extreme side of, of the auditorium, where the relationship to the heads in front of you and to the railing is quite different. So you have to start to look at it very carefully in three dimensions. There are ways that you can extrapolate this into a 2D section or start running numbers, but that gets really hard to visualize ultimately. What's that thing? Like. So we started um, uh, having the, the, auto, the uh, Excel spreadsheet output a 3D model. That became uh, possible. Um, and then we could sort of run the numbers, run the model, sit in the seat, and see what we could see. And that obviously is really, really helpful. And we can help our architect, the architects that we collaborate with, go from early conceptual thinking to uh, a, root, a, a crude 3D model, then they can use that 3D model as the basis for something that they render, um, and eventually it gets built and it hopefully it proves out what the software has been telling us. But that's been a great tool. But it's it's only a 2D image, right? It, it's still only a 2D image, and it's taken from a single point. So um, the whole question of what happens if I'm a little shorter? What happens if I lean a little bit my way? What would happen if I leaned forward in my chair and leaned on a railing? You can't answer those questions except by generating another view and rendering another view. So uh, recently, I think we're up to this part, yeah, uh, recently, <laughs> as you all read about, um, Oculus Rift came along. Um, and it became possible to study this sort of live um, and in three dimensions in a, in a sort of immersive way. And I'm going to let that, Alex. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Hi, everyone. I had no idea how many of you I knew from different parts of my architectural life. So good to see you. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Alex. Um, I've been at Fisher Dax Associates for a little over three years. And uh, all, all the stuff Josh was just showing you, uh, especially with the 3D CAD stuff in the Excel, that's been stuff that FDA's been doing for years, you know, dating back to the early days of CAD. And so when I first came, you know, I saw in CAD that there were were list routines in CAD that could, you know, you click on any scene in the hall and you jump right to that view. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. And so, you know, the early days when I just started kind of figuring out how to, to work with that um, workflow, so to speak, I saw that there were opportunities to start bringing things into 3ds Max. For those of you who are familiar with that, using Max Script, finding ways to output, you know, 800 seat views at a time. But then when the Oculus Rift came along, I mean, my first thought was. This is going to be an absolutely fantastic tool for getting inside of the spaces. But for those of you who don't know, the Oculus Rift, of course, was developed basically for video games. Um, we're starting to see it being used in a lot more things. I have a bright idea. There's my little light bulb going off. And you might think that the initial idea is just to occupy the space, to feel inside of it. And that sense of presence truly is fantastic for any kind of architectural uh, design. But we have a, a special use for it that really comes from, as Josh was showing you, our need to make sure that everyone has a fantastic seat view. So this is just very quickly kind of going through uh, my routine going from 3ds Max 
taking kind of all those extreme views from the centers and the aisles. I take it into Unity, which is a video game engine. And what you're arriving at now is this was the, the first iteration of the Oculus Rift that came out in 2013. So this was a really good tool for us. Um, it didn't have the motion tracking. You were basically rotating around a fixed point. But as Josh was saying, it, it means that we don't have to be kind of iterating each view on its own. It was an opportunity to uh, dynamically and interactively move through a space, go to different seats. Um, you know, again, you couldn't lean, but you could move your head around, and you had a sense like you were actually there. Um, for anyone who's confused by this image, what you're getting is two different eye views. So you, you put on the goggles, and your left eye and your right eye are seeing slightly offset images. So unlike if you go to like a 3D movie, that's essentially playing tricks on your eyes. This, I mean, this is a trick too, but it's a better trick because it's actually simulating the way your eyes work. You're getting a different view with each eye, and that gives you depth perception. So at first, because leaning was still important to us, um, we were finding ways to kind of simulate those different points. So in this example, we were looking at some side gallery views and figuring out what's, <laughs> what's it like if you're perpendicular to the railing and you know trying to look at the stage. What's it like if you rotate to the side and lean on the rail? And so this would be through a uh, kind of design iteration uh, process, which again, fantastic for any kind of architecture to be able to dynamically see different kinds of design iterations. In this example, it's different seating configurations, but it can be different wall sweeps, different materials. All this stuff can happen dynamically and interactively in VR. I'm just kind of moving through those spaces a little. So then the real exciting thing happened when the Oculus Rift DK2 came out. What you're noticing here is there's more movement. We're no longer stuck rotating along a fixed point. This now, thanks to this little camera here, which basically is tracking some uh, IR dots, for anyone who knows what that is, on the, uh, the Rift itself, it's tracking your motion. So it's a limited range because the camera has to be able to see you. But in this exact same theater, suddenly we're able to see how the view to the stage changes when you move to the right, move to the left, lean forward, lean backwards and it became a fantastic tool. Now, um, at first, of course, we thought this is gonna be a great way for us to present the model, but then as we started to do it in other theaters, um, this is the Wisconsin School of Music, we started to see a lot of different opportunities for making it work. Um, as Josh mentioned, we have an ongoing relationship with the Park Avenue Armory, not just with you know, the space at, as it became uh, renovated, uh, but also for all the very unique and exciting productions that they do there. So this was when we first started working with the Oculus Rift, and you know, I didn't know any coding. I had never worked with Unity, the video game engine. And we were starting to see the different things that that allowed us to do. And so you notice this is not a VR model, but this was an instance where we had a very tight deadline with the Park Avenue Armory to figure out uh, how to make all the seating work. We needed to figure out if the set design as designed was going to work. We needed to make sure that the actors were going to be able to see everything they needed to see. And so this was something that through Unity, the same engine that we're doing VR with, I was able to send the people at the Park Avenue Armory essentially an HTML file that they could open up in any browser and do everything you're seeing there. This and so was for the Ken Branham Macbeth that was there not too long ago where they had originally produced it in Manchester in a small church with 250 people, and they wanted to put it in the armory and perform to 1,000 people. So it just blew up enormously, and, um, and they, they didn't really understand what that experience would be like. So helping them to visualize it was really, really, really good for their creative team. And it was a, a truly epic production. I don't know if any of you got to see it, but it was essentially Game of Thrones live. You had rain coming down and fire and mud and sword fights. And uh, I think we all felt very lucky to be a part of making that happen. So then the next big thing that we found was, you know, the Oculus Rift was great for anyone that we could bring to our office. You need a fairly high-end machine to make the Oculus run. And That's it's big and heavy to wear on your face. Yes, <laughs> and the consumer version will be coming out in January of next year, so that'll, you know, it'll become a little bit more ubiquitous. This is technically a developer's kit. Um, once everyone starts using it for video games, that will push all the other industries, including architecture, forward with it. Um, so it was great for anyone coming to our office. We could set them up with a computer with a nice graphics card, and they could get a good frame rate to make VR work effectively. You really need a 75 frame per second you know, render time in there. And for those of us used to working with fo um, mo models and files like Revit, which can be very heavy, you know, these enormous files, it's very difficult to achieve that kind of frame rate. And so, uh, you know, what happened when we wanted to travel? You know, Josh was doing all these projects in London, and it's like, well, is he gonna cart around the Oculus? And what kind of laptop do we need to make that work? And so I started investigating uh, mobile 
devices and what kind of stuff could we do purely on a phone because a phone all these smartphones that we've had for years, even before you know the advent of the Oculus Rift, they have accelerometers and gyroscopes and magnetometers and all these different kind of technologies that can work together to help position you. The GPS doesn't work great as a motion tracking device yet because it's registering you within you know a, a 10 foot range or something like that. So that has a little ways to go. But uh, we had a very tight deadline in this situation where Josh was like, okay, I want to go to London. Um, I want to be able to give a presentation. I don't want it to be a PowerPoint. I want to be able to jump to any seat and all these kinds of things that I'd be like, that'd be great. But none of that had been worked out yet. I didn't know if it was going to be able to work well on a mobile phone. I didn't know if the level of interactivity he was requesting was going to be able to function because um, I was going to have to do a bunch of new scripting for it. And then there's a the question of how do we make it an interactive presentation if one person's looking through here and commenting like, what am I looking at right now? You know, you have to kind of pass the thing around and everyone has to look at it. So then we started using Google Chromecast, for anyone who's familiar with that. That allows you to project wirelessly something that's on a, a laptop or a TV or a phone screen to a monitor. And so what we were able to do, spoiler alert, I got it all to work out. Um, <laughs> what we were able to do with that is someone could be looking here at the screen and they're, you know, getting that depth perception, that sense of presence in this virtual space, but then everyone could see behind them what's actually going on inside um, of the space. So this is a project just to give you a little bit more detail on how it goes through. This one started in SketchUp. Um, again, there's like a week turnaround time. So similar to the stuff you saw before, I've kind of got a method for just dropping all the seats in the theater. We had some different design options, an Elizabethan stage configuration versus a thrust stage. And we wanted to be able to show those different stage options. We wanted to be able to, again, look from any seat in the hall. So now we're in Unity. And, you know, have some simple materiality just to, to give it a little bit of a sense of space. Um, that's me just fooling around with lighting. And what we started to find around this point was the Rift was no longer, it had no longer become just a presentation tool. It was a design tool. This was something that we used just among ourselves just to check and make sure that things looked right, that they felt right, that, you know, when you're leaning forward and if we're mocking up like a railing, that that feels correct. Um, and if not, you know, we need to figure out how to push the seats back. So I had it scripted um, to figure out a way to, you know, have kind of simulated leaning. But with, so with the Oculus, we could do all of the motion tracking and all that in real time. And then once we knew it was working, since the phone doesn't have motion tracking, I could kind of have a toggle for, you know, the, the main view versus the leaning view. And it worked out really well. Um, I think you're going to see in a second here. So yeah, so we could go through those different design options that we're looking at in the space. Now, just to give you a sense of how interdisciplinary all of this is, uh, the only reason I was able to make this happen in a week was totally by coincidence. The week before that, I was participating down at NYU uh, in what's called the Global Game Jam. And this is the thing that happens every year where people all over the world get together and they design a video game over 48 hours. And this is something I've done for a few years. Again, I'm not a video game designer. The first year I did it, I ended up making a card game. The second year I made a simple side scroller. And then this year, because I was starting to get more comfortable with VR, I was like, I'd really love to make a VR game. And for anyone who's been part of a charrette, you know, uh, you sometimes you have to learn really fast on a tight deadline like that. So I was with all these people, many of whom were far more talented programmers than I. And we're trying to think, what could we do over 48 hours that would work well as a video game? And uh, the, the prompt that everyone had to respond to was, what do we do now? And so the way we interpreted that was, okay, what if you're a space pilot and you're with your fleet and you're all about to head out to battle and you know everyone's getting pumped, there's stuff on the radio, and you're all like, oh, we're going to avenge our families and it's going to be great. And then what if your entire ship just broke down? So that way we're like, oh, okay, we're saving ourselves all sorts of programming. You don't have to worry about uh, what is actually going to happen with this space battle. You don't have to worry about um, AI or anything like that. So here you're seeing everyone else warp into hyperspace. And you think you're about to go too, and then your ship just blah, breaks down. And so then what you're left with is a puzzle game. So I bring this up because the scripting that I had to figure out here. Yeah, so you're a hotshot pilot, and then suddenly your ship breaks down, and you're like, what do I do now? So that's the, that's the response to the prompt. We won a couple of awards. It was really cool. But um, yeah, so you're like, what do I do now? And then basically you're going around and you're looking at all these different buttons and you're, you know, think of like a race car driver who doesn't know how to change a tire. It's like, what happens if I press this? Uh, for anyone who's played Mastermind, it was a little bit like that. So the scripting that I had to figure out to make it so you could look at a button, have the button glow and click on it, that was exactly what Josh was requesting the very next week for looking at any seat and jumping to those seats. So it was kind of cool how, you know, the script that I never would have thought of before in a different context became very useful for, you know, my actual job. 
Um, and yeah, so I, I guess really what we're getting at here, we're kind of near the end of the presentation, is that first we saw the Oculus Rift as a fantastic presentation tool if we want to show someone what a space looks like they can get a sense of what of how it actually feels. Not everyone is literate when it comes to seeing plans, sections, even renderings, and this is a way to make sure they really have a sense of the space. Um, and then what we found out in the past few months is that when we're working with architects, when we're working with other consultants, it really works as a fantastic collaboration tool. We can get all these other designers in the room and we can sit down with them and we can be using Chromecast and we can have the little you know, cardboard devices around and we can be showing all the different things we need to and without having a you know, PowerPoint presentation, we can all kind of get a sense of how the space exists, look at different design options and really feel like we're there. So you know, that is to say that we're, we're headed towards um, uh, a world and a time where this is just going to be common practice, the same, you know, the same way that uh, CAD kind of, or maybe BIM is more a better example of uh, how uh, the industry is kind of being revolutionized of a different way of designing and different way of thinking. Last thought, um, where's this head in the future? I mentioned that, um, you know, hopefully phones get to the point where they can do some motion tracking. Um, there was also an interesting request back in early April to see if I could take another aspect of video games and really make it work for what we're doing in architecture. And so I thought really hard about it. And we just wanted a new way to interact with audiences, so um, I came up with this. And I, I think it's pretty effective at, uh, it was an April Fool's joke, we called it Apple Fool's. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so again, it's really cool how to uh, you can go across these different disciplines like video games, and something that, you know, could be used for shooting people can actually be like jumping to see views. That guy almost dodged it, not quite. <laughs> He's just cowering. Uh, so there we go. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening, guys. And if you have any questions, Josh and I are happy to answer them. And then we also have plenty of toys for you to check out. Thank you very much. Cool. We have a couple of models that we can put on our phones and, and pass them around in the cardboard. There are a bunch of different viewers. Do yeah. want to talk about the Yeah, yeah. So real quick on that. So uh, <laughs> you guys remember these things? This is kind of 